And we're live for a very special Christmas Eve edition of Grade School. Hello to any of you lunatics who are crazy enough to show up and talk about color grading and color science and color geekery on Christmas Eve. Uh, I am really glad to be with you guys. And uh, honestly, I've, I've, I'm having a good holiday, but kind of more mellow than I'm used to having uh, in terms of my my like life tempo. So I'm excited to have something to do today and uh, to do with you guys. And, and uh, of course, we're going to be uh, working with and talking about my very favorite subject in the world. So I'm so excited uh, to be doing this special Christmas Eve edition of grade school with you guys. And anybody who couldn't uh, make it and is too busy with family commitments and uh, whatever else, other merriment they're getting into, they're missing out, man. This is the best place to be. We're going to have some fun today. Um, so welcome to all of you guys. Uh, let's talk about some color. Let's talk about uh, some color grading. And specifically today, let's talk about film emulation because we don't talk about that enough on the channel, do we? Um, I thought this would be a really good subject to take a look at in a uh, more focused uh, context than we normally do, because it's usually kind of incidental to a lot of other subjects that we discuss. And uh, my the main format I want to use here today is to do more of kind of an ask me anything format. So I'm not going to go as long with my initial remarks as I might normally. Um, but I am going to sort of try to frame our initial conversation about film emulation in a slightly different way than uh, we might typically think about it. So let me start by talking about that. And then, uh, as I said, I uh, want to answer as many of your questions as possible today about this subject, because it does seem there's a lot of confusion out there about it. So get those questions ready. Think about what you've always wanted to understand. Think about the questions that you've always been afraid to ask or you feel like would be dumb to ask. I promise you they're not dumb. And I promise you, if you're wondering uh, about these things, someone else is wondering about them too. So get those things ready, because I'm going to open the floor up to you guys uh, in just a couple of minutes here. So let's talk about film emulation. So I'm already here in my resolve. Apparently I'm ready to rock and roll. I'm ready to, to, to get after this thing. So let's start with taking a look at a film emulation LUT, okay? Because that's really the basis of what most of us uh, are gonna be doing when we're looking at a film emulation is evaluating like, okay, what does a high quality trustworthy film LUT do to my image? And I think one of the main aspects of film emulation that we are all most broadly interested in that I know I am uh, keenly interested in is figuring out like, okay, how do we take the essence of that sound film emulation and adapt it and make it uh, versatile and sort of modular for application in a color managed modern workflow. Um, so let's kind of take a look at things from that perspective uh, and uh, see where we go. So uh, I'm here in Resolve. I got nothing going on whatsoever on any of these images, no grades, no color management, nothing at all. So let's go to my good old uh, trustworthy Isabella here. And I'm gonna go in and I'm going to pull uh, a PFE LUT that I trust, okay? Uh, and it really doesn't matter what LUT you are using here. What matters is that it's trustworthy. Now, let me actually see where the hell I put this. I might have to refresh my LUT folder here and sip coffee whilst I do. Here we go. So this is a 2383 LUT. Like I said, doesn't really matter that this is any different from a, a LUT that you might have or want to use. I just, uh, it's, it's one that I've uh, uh, sort of tuned and sweetened from uh, some uh, good like profile data. But like if we compare this to like the Resolve like 2383 D60 or D65, it's not like a world away. It's just a, a little bit uh, of a different approach, but same, you, you could use uh, one of those Resolve film look LUTs just as easily for uh, what we're going to be doing right now. So. Let's first just observe a moment of appreciation, a moment of pleasure in looking at when I apply this LUT on these different images, you know, like we've all got our own taste and stuff, but like, oh yeah, like you can't see my full screen, but you can see my, my little cinema viewer here. So I'll do that. Let me do a little balancing underneath this image, kind of cool things off a little bit. Like, let's just admire. That's really beautiful. It's like doing really beautiful stuff to my image, right? At least by my eye. Maybe you think it looks terrible. But I just, I, I always like to start there of like, man, that just looks good. I like, 
everything that I'm seeing, even if I don't know exactly all the complex stuff that's happening under the hood, and there is complex stuff happening under the hood that we're gonna talk about, I just like what it's doing. I just like the image. And really it's worth emphasizing, that's our starting point for uh, this conversation about film emulation. The reason we talk about film emulation so much and uh, the reason it's such a uh, like hot topic in color grading is because film systems produce really, really good looking images. Like that just looks phenomenal to me. So that can be our sort of starting point is like looking at, wow, that just looks really nice. Now, almost as soon as we fall in love with the film emulation lot, at least this was my journey, almost as soon as we fall in love with it, we start to encounter problems. We start to run into challenges, right? Let's think of the biggest challenge right off the bat for me, as you guys know, I like to work in some kind of color managed environment. I've made a very strong case for that many, many, many times in grade school. So I'm not going to uh, bore us with the, uh, the, that that case again today. But to me, color management when you're uh, grading in 2021 and now 2022 is a non-negotiable because your grade is not what your grade looks like on a Rec. 709 monitor. Your grade is something more than that. And your Rec. 709 monitor is simply a window into that grade. Okay. So when we have a transform like this one that is imparting not only a bunch of tasty creative mojo, but which is imparting a display transform, because you'll notice, I remember I said, I'm not color managed right now. This is taking me from scene space to display space. I'm in Rec. 709 now, right? So the first question that comes up is like, okay, this is all great if all I need to do is deliver Rec. 709. But what if I want to deliver 1000 nit P3 D65 HDR? What if I want to uh, deliver for any other format besides Rec. 709? I am going to have trouble with that because I am married into a display space. And as we've talked about in other episodes of grade school, getting from a display space back into a scene space or getting from a display space to a larger display space is a challenge. And there's no single objective and perfect way of doing that. It's simply a matter of where we make uh, compromises that we can live with. So. Having a LUT, regardless of how good it might look, of how, how uh, many nice things it might do to our image, having a LUT which has a cooked in display transform is a challenge. It's uh, something that we uh, are gonna wanna overcome almost as soon as we start using this transform. At least that was my journey. So that's where the question comes in of like, all right, how can we begin to dissect and unpack and deconstruct and decouple all of the behaviors that are making up this transform that we call a PFE LUT, how can we pull those things apart and say, okay, I just want a kind of tasting menu of like, I want that creative contrast ratio, but I don't want the display transform as an example. Or I want the colorimetry the way that like, look at my, look at the yellow patch on this image here. It's a little tough to evaluate coming from scene space, but the yellow patch is being rotated. You can see it down here a little bit more. It's being rotated a bit more kind of marigold and a little bit less yellowy. So we could say, oh, I want like all of that creative mojo, but I don't necessarily want any or uh, I want less of like the contrast, the creative contrast that's coming from this transform. All kinds of uh, scenarios we can imagine in which we would want to break apart and have sort of uh, manual control over the individual elements that make this look what it is, right? So the question arises there, how do we meaningfully model those things out or pull those things uh, out of uh, being all bundled together? And there's lots of different ways to do that. And that's really what we're talking about when we talk about print film emulation is like, okay, how can we emulate maybe not in not just the whole system, but the individual behaviors of that system. And there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, but I just wanted to very quickly show you guys some principles that I like to keep in mind for that. So if we just start from a really simple sort of practical POV here, let's frame our, our conversation a bit more. Let's say that for the moment, I'm, I am working Rec. 7 or 9. However, I want to come up with a creative transform that works equally well for Rec. 7 or 9 or whatever other uh, display I might be targeting with my color management. So what I want to do is take this and match it or get a reasonable match to it when I'm working inside of a color managed pipeline. So in this case, if we keep things as simple as possible and keep the variables as, as few as possible, that might look something like this. If I turn that off and I use one of 
many solutions that I might use for my color management, as we've talked about. I'm, I'm picking this sort of out of a hat. If I use some Resolve color management to get out to Rec. 709, we now are basically saying, I want to do something here which matches this to that. Does that make sense? This is the, uh, in the, you know, like high school algebra, uh, like sort of uh, way of thinking of it. This is the unknown that we need to solve for. This is the X that we need to solve for. We know this is our target. We know that this constraint needs to be here because this just represents a neutral technical mapping in our color management pipeline of choice. So I need to do something here that's going to get me this. Now, let me ask everybody a question. For any of you guys who have played around with film print emulation at all, have any of you guys ever taken a stab at manually recreating a film print inside of Resolve with the tools of Resolve? This can be inside a color managed pipeline like I'm proposing right now, or just in general, just saying from scratch, I just wanna recreate this using the tools within Resolve. Anybody ever done that before? I imagine we've got a few of you guys out there who have. Let's see if we have anyone. I guess you guys are a couple minutes uh, behind me or 30 seconds or so behind me. So I'll leave the question as a hypothetical. Those of us who have done that, those of us who have tried to make that manual adaptation have probably noticed this. You can get a reasonably good match if you know what levers to pull on a particular image, right? You can, you probably like with enough fussing and with enough kind of like manually fooling around, you can probably get a reasonably good match to what you're seeing in your reference image. And then what happens? Then you go to a new shot and you paste whatever uh, stack of adjustments that you've made to try to get that match onto that new shot. And it looks nothing like it. Maybe it even looks worse or further away than it did to begin with. You're, it, it, it doesn't travel, right? You guys had this experience before? Maybe I'm the only one. And if you haven't, then you'll have to take my word for it that if you use the tools of color correction and if you're only measuring stick is one image at a time, you are going to have an incredibly difficult time of trying to match this to that. And the reason is what's going on here that's producing this is really not something that we can aim at in a terribly sophisticated way using the tools of color correction or the tools of color grading because the tools of color grading and color correction are not aimed at crafting pipelines. They are aimed at grading shots, right? So we kind of need to go off the reservation if we want to make a really meaningful go of emulating film. And to get a better look at this, I'm going to take us uh, over into uh, an unknown realm that we've towed our, uh, put a toe into the water of a couple times this year, the Fusion page, okay? If you've never seen the Fusion page, if you don't know what you're looking at, that's okay. I'm going to walk you through what we're doing. So fundamentally, Fusion uses nodes, just like Resolve. So to start, I'm just going to manually set up my same color management that I was doing over on the color page. Like so, same exact settings. This is the same exact CST that, in fact, the same uh, filter that I was using in the Resolve side. It's just now here in Fusion. And everything in Fusion is happening upstream of whatever's happening in the Resolve. So that's why whatever I did over on the Resolve side is not showing up here in Fusion. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to do something that uh, you guys may have seen me do a couple times in the past. I am going to create a sort of dual view pipeline here. And we're going to get our, we're going to get a very useful sort of secondary context on our transform on whatever we are doing by looking at not only what is what we do do to the image, but what does it do to this cube? Because this cube, for those of you guys who may not be familiar, represents all possible red, green and blue values at input and at output. So down here is black. Uh, excuse me, uh, down here is black, up here is white, over here is red, over here is blue, up here is green, over here is yellow, and back here in this bottom corner is magenta, like so. So this just represents a unity cube, if you will. And let's just start by looking at that same LUT that I was evaluating a moment ago, this 2383, This will take just a minute to spin up. Okay, so 
we can get a better sense, even if, if it's a bit of an intimidating sense. Does this give you a better sense of the task before us? We have to turn this into that without using this. Anyone have any clue how to do that? I didn't. It's not so easy. And just to prove a point, let's have a go at it using like this color corrector here inside of uh, Fusion, which is uh, going to have the same type of controls that we might have in Resolve. Like, let's give it a try. Maybe it's a contrast thing. Maybe it's my gain. Could it be my lift? Is it my gamma? I'm getting nowhere. I'm getting nowhere at all, right? This is just linear adjustments. I could even get fancy and use a matrix, which uh, on the color page might be along the lines of the, uh, is, is uh, akin to the RGB mixer, okay? Now at least I can move stuff in diagonals and I have the ability to control saturation. But again, I can't get like that character that I'm seeing in this cube. And if I trust uh, as I should, and you, you may have to trust me here, that the relationship between this and this is not coincidental. All right, let me uh, make a better example of this. Hang tight one moment. I wanna move this up here and then move my instance down here and turn this off temporarily, like so. So uh, what I was saying is the relationship between this and that is not coincidental, it's meaningful. This is showing me in a broader context in many ways what I am doing, what I'm getting a narrower preview of here in my image. These two things are interrelated. If I can do this, I can get that. And if I can't do this, I'm gonna have trouble getting that on any but an individual shot basis. That makes sense. So I point all of this out to sort of initially frame the conversation of like, what's up with print film emulation? Why is it so discussed? Why do we find it so difficult? Why are there so many different points of view and solutions and ideas floating out there around it? It's because it's complex. And because even though at the end of it, it's just a LUT in this case, this film emulation, it embodies an incredible amount of like uh, creative engineering that is going into producing these behaviors. It's not just a coincidence and it's not a set of simple linear behaviors that we might be able to recreate with a color corrector and a matrix, for example. So this is where needing to get more fancy and actually live for longer here on the Fusion page and really sculpt this cube in non-linear ways is the only way to start to get First of all, just a baseline match to uh, what we're seeing here, but then even more so for like, oh, I wanna start pulling that apart and I wanna just get the contrast or just get the colorimetry or just get uh, you know, one aspect of uh, this print film emulation. That is gonna have to come from modeling out those what we could call sub behaviors using the additional context, not only of a single image at a time, but using a cube to guide us and to really help us analyze what's going on there that I like so much and how can I recreate it, not using the stock tools of color grading, but using the more complex tools of color science, which uh, are designed for modeling out pipelines. So that's kind of like a very brief introduction to some of the key facets that go into print film emulation and why it's so difficult. And if you feel overwhelmed by that, uh, that's okay. I still feel overwhelmed by it and I work at it all the time. Uh, but I just want to point out that it's, we talk about print film emulation so much and there are so many different ideas out there about it because it is an inherently complex subject. And I want to point out anybody who's telling you that it is not, that it is simple, or anyone who is suggesting to you, oh, I got a good print film emulation using my primaries, using like my lift gamma gain or even my custom curves, they're either not being honest with you or they're not being honest or they're just not paying very good attention because you are never going to get a meaningful model of a film system using the simple linear tools of color correction. It's just never going to happen. You're going to have to have some kind of more robust model if your goal and expectation is truly to get a meaningful reproduction of one or more behaviors that we're seeing embodied here using uh, your own uh, sort of synthetic means, if we want to call it that. So some initial thoughts about print film emulation, um, but uh, I will pause my remarks there and see if we've had any questions come up thus far about uh, film emula emulation. Got a few coming in. Okay. Uh, Ecto would like to know, 
Uh, did you convert to Cineon before the initial transformation you used? Ah, so that's a good, good question. In this case, I did not because the LUT that I'm using uh, may be the most significant difference. I'm just going to flip my junk off here and go back to my warm and fuzzy color page. Uh, the reason I did not in this case uh, for this shot is because this LUT, I have adapted it and designed it to actually accept uh, area wide gamut log C as opposed to uh, a Cineon input. But that would typically be uh, the better move to tee up like Rec. 7 or 9 Cineon uh, feeding into, for example, like the Resolve film looks, that's what they are expecting. Other questions? And on a similar note, Sky is wondering, do you convert HLG footage to Cineon before you start grading? Do you convert HLG footage to Cineon before you start grading? Um, well, that's a bit of a loaded question because HLG is actually a display uh, encoding. Um, I know that there are cameras that capture in it, but uh, it, there's, there's variability in and of itself there because that's a display uh, color space um, or a display uh, encoding curve, I should say. So in general, like my pipeline, if I were in like a super vanilla, like, I don't know, um, like, I, I guess I'll put it this way. If I'm using a traditional PFE LUT and if I weren't fully color managing in the sense that I could flip my output transform at will, I would still at the very least, like in this type of setup, I would want to have a stock working color space and then sort of a node that uh, brings me into the space that the um, LUT is expecting uh, right before the LUT. So I wouldn't necessarily... Even in this case, we're like, here. here's how I would work with the uh, Resolve Film Looks LUT. I would go Area Alexa Log C to Rec. 7 and 9 Cineon, and I would make sure to luminance map so I can fit those curves into the appropriate place, and definitely gamut map as well. Um, so I would be doing something like this. However, I would kind of treat these as one unit, and I would do all of my grading over here in in this case, Area Alexa Log C, because that's a color space that I like to work in. But this could be whatever I want it to be. If you if you were shooting uh, HLG, for example, or you've got S Log 3 or Red Wide Gamut, it doesn't really matter. It matters that you're in a color space that you're comfortable with. You are converting into, uh, in this case, Rec. 7 or 9 Cineon in preparation for this film look slot and that kind of becomes your pipeline to get out again there's compromises there because you're in sort of a faux color managed workflow there in the sense that you are color managed and you're working in a log or a scene space but you don't have the ability to easily flip yourself into say p3d 65,000 nit um, but that would be kind of how i would tackle um, like teeing up and making transforms in preparation for in this case the rec 7 or 9 kodak 2383 Jim is curious, uh, when having project settings uh, out to Rec. 709 and you use a CST, then you work uh, behind it, are you still not working in Rec. 709 before the CST? Isn't it still Rec. 709? Let's see. When you have project settings out to Rec. 709 and you use a CST, oh, I think we were saying project settings set to Rec. 709, and you use a CST, then you work behind it. Are you still not working? Are you not still working in Rec. 7 or 9? Ah, good question. Yes. So uh, if I understand it correctly, Jim's question, which I think is a good one for all of us to answer or to answer together, is if I am in the following type of workflow. So here in my project settings, well, I'm going to remember this time to actually make those visible to you guys. There we go. Here's some project settings coming in. When I'm in my project settings and I have my timeline color space set to Rec. 7 or 9, Gamma 2, 4. Let me flip that off now. And Jim's question is, when I have my project settings set up in that way, and when I'm going out to Rec. 7 or 9, like so, here on node number 1, am I grading in Rec. 7 or 9? Anyone have any guesses out there? Take a guess in the chat. I'll give you a second to before I spoil it, spoil it with the answer. The other way to phrase this question in the broader sense would be, let's go back to 
this guy, what does this mean? When I say time, when I'm not color managed in the project settings and I say timeline color space, what exactly does that mean? It seems so simple until you think about it for a minute. And you're like, wait, what, what does that mean? All right, so I'll spoil it. To directly answer Jim's question, no, we are not in Rec 709 over here. We are in, in this case, Area Alexa Log C because that's the state of my image when I read it in. And uh, I have yet to do anything to it here in node number two. So remember, when we are in DaVinci YRGB for our color management, what we are telling Resolve is, hey, hands off. Don't mess with my color management. Don't do me any favors. Don't do anything on my behalf. I got this. I'm going to do everything. I don't need your help. I don't want your help. That's what we're telling Resolve when we say DaVinci YRGB. Okay, easy enough. Why then, what effect then does that timeline color space setting have? Um, we've talked about this in prior episodes of grade school, so I'm gonna make kind of a lightning round of it, but there are four things that that setting affects that we can talk about uh, very quickly. Uh, by the way, this is not anywhere in the Resolve manual or documentation, so if you wanna take notes, this is a really good thing to have a, a record of and, and notes on because it's, as we're, finding out right now kind of confusing as to like what does that mean when i say timeline color space if it's if there's no color management being done on my behalf so let's talk about the four things that that setting is going to affect number one if i right click on this node here and i say gamma linear we've talked about this before how does it know how to move me into linear if i'm only giving it one side of the equation any of you guys who've been hanging out in grade school for a while know that moving into or out of a color space requires two uh pieces of information, right? What are you coming from and what are you going to? So when I say resolve, I would like you inside of this node, like on either side of whatever grading I do in this node to move me from my working color space into linear, let me do my thing inside of this node and then move me from linear back to my working color space. What's the missing piece of information there? Well, what's your working color space? That is one of these settings that is going to look to the timeline color space setting that we've selected to, to answer. So right now, if I set this to linear, I'm going to get very nonsensical results because I have moved my, um, I, I have applied on either end of whatever I do in this node, I have applied a Rec 709 to linear transform. I've done my work and then I'm applying a linear to Rec 709 transform, neither of which are appropriate for what I'm doing because I'm not in Rec 709, am I? I'm in area log C because as we just uh, recapped, I'm in log C by default because that's the state of the image and, and Resolve isn't changing that for me. So that's the first thing that that setting is going to affect, okay? The next thing that that setting is going to affect, the HDR zones palette. When I go over here, if I, for example, go to my global exposure, I'm not going to get sensible, I'm not going to get accurate results, I should say, because under the hood, the HDR palette for all of its internal operations, it is also doing bookended color space transforms from our working space to its own internal linearized space and then back out to our working space. Now, how does it know what our working space is? It looks to that same menu item in our project settings. Okay, so that's item number two. If that uh, timeline color space is flagged in a manner that is not consistent with what we are actually grading in at the point we use the HDR palette, we are not going to get proper or accurate results. That's number two. Number three, if I go over here and I go to deliver right now, this one, uh, in this case, I'm going to be better off with the setting that I've just selected, but down here in my advanced settings, color space tag and gamma tag, same as project. Do you want to know what it thinks of when it says project? timeline color space. That's what it is looking to, to find uh, the answer to that question is like, what is the, what is the timeline color space? What tag should I stick in here? It's going to look to the timeline color space setting for that information. And in our case right now, actually, this is the one area where having our timeline color space set to rec 709 gamma 24, even though we are working in area log C, it's actually good for it to be there because that means that our tags are going to be appropriate when I output this. So what's more common is for me, when my settings are like so, let me set my timeline color space. When I'm set to area log C, like so, let me now turn this off. And when I go to render, 
part one of the one of my sort of like due diligence pieces that I always have to make sure of when I render is I need to manually set these things because if I don't, a color space tag of Airy Alexa log C or uh, whatever uh, tags are closest to that that Resolve can find, that's what's going to be cooked into the metadata of my file. I don't want that because this file is not at the point of render a Airy log C file. It's seven or nine gamma two four or whatever I'm outputting for display wise. So. That is the third of the four ingredients uh, that we uh, are going to see that our timeline color space is uh, going to affect, okay? And like I said, this isn't written down anywhere and I always forget this, uh, I, I, so I, I'm, I'm trying to remember, oh, I know the other, uh, the, the, the fourth and final uh, place where timeline color space is going to come into play. If I go here to my color space transform and I say use timeline, you guessed it, it's going to look to my project settings for what that color space is. So this is again another area where for that reason in this case as well as in the metadata tagging that, that I was talking about over on the deliver page, because this can so easily be changed by one setting being altered in my project settings, I always do these things manually. So even if like regardless of whether I'm keying in uh, parameters that match my timeline color space. I will never use timeline here, nor will I ever use timeline for my color space tag or use same as project here on the deliver page, simply because it makes me feel warm and fuzzy to lock it up in the explicit correct setting and not to be dependent on a potentially moving part there in my project settings. So there's your, that maybe wasn't necessarily brief, but that's a really good recap of something that I wish was in the Resolve documentation. Those are the four things that uh, your uh, timeline color space setting when your color management is set to DaVinci YRGB are going to affect. And those are the only four things that uh, they are going to affect, that it is going to affect, I should say. It is never going to apply any flavor, any kind of color management on your behalf. So if I bring in an Airy Log C image that's in Airy Log C, and I am downstream transforming to Rec. 7 or 9, but I'm working upstream of that, I'm in Airy Log C. To uh, go back to the original quite simple question that I made a rather long answer of. Okay, uh, Philippe is wondering if you're able to go over bleach bypass as far as film emulation goes. Yeah, so let's talk about the bleach bypass process. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Leave, I think Philippe uh, at, was, it, it was also the one asking a week or two ago about this, and I'm gonna keep you in suspense a little bit longer. Now the reason is that I have something very close to actually being able to show you like a pretty robust bleach bypass model based on actual measured data from film scans, but it's not something I'm uh, ready, not something I can put it that way, share quite yet. So I feel like it's it's much more fun to show than to tell. So I'm gonna keep you in suspension on the, on the bleach bypass thing just a little bit longer, even though I'm thinking about bleach bypass a ton and I'm very excited to talk about it as soon as possible. How are we doing out there? I can I can I can keep uh, demoing some stuff if we've gotten kind of caught up. Got more. Okay. Um, a lot of in interesting questions coming in. Um, let's see. Martin uh, is asking if you debayer a B rock clip directly as uh, DaVinci Wide Gamut instead of a BMD film log, is that the same thing as using a CST to go from BMD film log to DaVinci Wide Gamut? Theoretically, yes. You may encounter localized differences, but theoretically, yes. Uh, the, 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 to, to the extent that we can trust the implicit claim of that uh, debayering, uh, that like, hey, I'm going to accurately debayer what the camera saw into the color space you tell me, in this case, DaVinci Wide Gamma Intermediate. That's the implicit claim there, of course, as is uh, the claim of a color space transform that says, hey, you tell me what you're coming from and where you're going to, and I will uh, faithfully technically accurately make that transformation for you. If we take those things on their face, then yes, that's exactly right. And I can tell you from uh, uh, anecdotal experience that uh, debayering, at least into, I, I debayer B-RAW typically into Airy Log C because that's what I work in. That works quite nicely. So uh, short answer, yes. And another question from Jim. 
why do people try to do print emulation in the same order as the original process, for example, halation on the negative, et cetera, when digital is a completely different process, the order uh, should be irrelevant? Yeah, I'm glad we asked that. That really goes to something that, that I, I, I have strong creative convictions about, put it this way. I think that there is a pretty firm upper limit to the utility of like a forensic level film emulation. And I'll give you guys a spoiler alert. After having spent time with some of the most knowledgeable people about this stuff in the world, chief among them, uh, Dr. Mitch Bogdanovich, who helped design these films for many, many decades for Kodak. After having spent a long time talking with Dr. Bogdanovich and a number of other people who, if, if they don't know, no one does about this process, the more you dig into it and the more you set about the goal of like, I want to take the light that this digital sensor saw and I want to transform every inch of it into the exact same equivalent sequence of manipulations that that light hitting a film negative and going through a film system from that point forward. I want to like forensically precisely model that out every link in that chain as Jim is suggesting. It's actually not really possible because at every single turn there are assumptions that we have to make and judgment calls that we have to make because it is so very complex and because as Jim points out, they're different systems. They fundamentally see light in a different way. We can account for a lot of that. We can come up with a very, very good visual reproduction of what that system might have done under a particular set of conditions. And that's another whole topic we can talk about. It's like, well, right off the bat, are you trying to model what a specific roll of film did on a specific day after being shot through a specific lens and processed through a specific bath and printed to a specific uh, like manufactured film print, like an a individual unit of film print, I mean? Or are you trying to get some kind of idealized like best fit of like, if I average together 100 different film negatives capturing the same thing and 100 different film prints capturing the same thing, I'm not gonna get the same result every time because it's an analog format. Do I average those all together and is that a more meaningful model? That's like the surface, like the very outer layer of the kind of questions you have to scratch your head at if you're trying to get this crazy forensic level of emulation. So to answer Jim's question, I think the reason why people do that is because they're misunderstanding the the they're they're misaligning their goals and thinking that oh if first of all it's possible to get this one to one forensic recreation and there's an underlying assumption there that if i do i will get the best visual result neither of those things are actually true i understand the temptation to believe them and the temptation to seek them uh, it only took me a decade of fooling around with this stuff to realize that they're not true, but I promise you they're not true. So to that extent, that like it, that that's that's why I think we do it that way is because it's, at least it was in my case for the many years I was working in that way, it's mislaid expectations and assumptions that like, oh, if I do this, I'll get the best possible results and it's possible to do this in, an, in a pure technical way, in a pure like objective way. It's not. We have to make assumptions. We have to make inferences and best guesses and judgment calls at every turn. So that leads me personally to say, okay, the best thing I can do here is get a really dimensional understanding of what that system is doing using not only uh, the evaluation of imagery, like we're looking at here in the color page, but the evaluation of like, what does it do to a cube? Like we just looked at infusion. What does it do to a 1D ramp? There are other even more sophisticated tools that we can use to really get a good window into like, what exactly is that thing? And what are all of its particulars? But then I think the most creatively beneficial thing that we can do is to zoom out a little bit and say like, okay, I'm going to creatively, subjectively borrow the pieces that I find most creatively advantageous as opposed to like perpetually looking in the rear view mirror and saying, well, we've peaked. Nothing's ever gonna look better than film. And now all we can do is, is like, the extent to which our images look good is the extent to which we are able to one-to-one -to -one reproduce the results that we would get from a system that is dead or dying. 
Uh, I think that's a pretty depressing thought, and I think we can do better. And there's all kinds of stuff that come with, with film systems that are not desirable. The variability that I just talked about, that's not desirable. Who wants, who, who among us would, would, would uh, like sign off on, how would you like to have a system that gives you one result on one run of negative in print and a different result the next day? Like that's not optimal, that's not ideal, that's just unavoidable with a film system. Another one is that we started the conversation with like, well, film prints, there's no such, no such thing as an HDR film print. Film prints max out at an absolute peak of about 48 nits. What if I want something brighter that still looks good? Am I just out of luck because all I can do is grope at this uh, system that is, uh, you know, like hasn't evolved past that? Uh, in a, a number of years, like there's all kinds of uh, undesirable aspects of film as well. And I think the only way we can borrow the best of the film tradition is to recognize like it's not perfect. It's just the results of about a century of really smart people working really hard to make images look really good. And if we steal the best parts of that tradition and leap behind the parts that they weren't able to push further, because this is something else that you can hear about from Dr. Mitch Bogdanovich, any other number of the engineers and scientists who were actually working on the problems of imagery production with film systems, there's lots of complaints. They're like, we can't get this any better. We tried. Right now, we got to ship this print stock and it's going to have to do. There's all kinds of compromises and things they wish they could do better that we now can do better, that they would have killed to have the ability to do. So if we're not taking advantage of that stuff, that's, in my opinion, just dumb. Um, anyway. Lots of thoughts about that, but uh, that, that's my, my answer to the original question is because I think people are fundamentally misunderstanding uh, what's useful and valuable about uh, mimicking or borrowing elements of uh, a traditional film system. All right, on a related note, Depender is asking, can you talk about negative emulations and what's the difference between print and negative emulation for creating looks? Yeah, so we can definitely talk about that. So. Here's the first thing to understand when we talk about, you know, we, 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 we tend to use the, the acronym PFE or we talk about print film emulation a lot. We're really talking about negative. Uh, we're, we're talking about negative plus print film emulation, generally speaking. We need to understand that in a traditional film system, the entire thing is a black box that's designed to work as a unit. And that's kind of one of the challenges of it is a traditional film system is designed for the following. It's designed to take light in and it's designed to put light back out in the form of uh, a projected print that looks good that has a naturalistic and pleasing reproduction it's a black box so the idea of like one of the one of the the like I've, I've already talked a bunch of today about like oh wouldn't it be fun to sort of be able to like cut into that organism and extract like oh i just want this piece of it, but not that piece. And it is fun and it can be cool. One of the least sensible uh, axes to cut into that organism along is the axis or the dividing point between a negative and a print. Because there's a ton of the behavior of a film negative that is done in preparation for the fact that it's going to be going to a film print. So film negative was never designed to be pleasing or uh, like to produce great visual results in and of itself, nor was a film print ever designed to be pleasing and produce optimal results in and of itself. It is designed to expect a negative input and a negative is designed to receive a print, uh, a subsequent print transformation. So that's the first thing to understand. Now, what we can do and uh, what is very worth while to do is we can still be modular in the sense that like, okay, I'm going to be in a film system and I'm going to have separate modules for emulating negative and emulate, emulating print. I'm just simply going to understand that if I don't marry my negative to a print or if I don't marry my print to a negative, I can't necessarily expect great results because that's not what the system I am mimicking or modeling was designed to do with these photons, with this light. So they kind of marry together. So that's kind of principle number one to understand about neg emulation. And now if we think further about neg emulation, all kinds of other interesting questions come into play that kind of go along the lines of what we were just talking about of like, well, what are the great things and also the limitations of uh, film negative? Here's, here's one that uh, is not popular and people don't like to talk about. Film negative doesn't have the dynamic range that a modern digital sensor does. It just doesn't. So 
What do we do with that? Do I want to mimic the lower dynamic range of a film negative? That's not the craziest thing in the world, but it's also another example of the type of subjective question we have to answer if we're going to emulate film negatives. Like, what parts do we want to emulate? Do we really want to emulate that part? I don't necessarily see a benefit to rolling off my highlights prematurely that otherwise would be preserved and available to me in a grade. I'm not sure what the benefit is there unless I'm really trying to do like, unless I'm really trying to quote something. If I'm doing like a, if I'm, if I'm trying to like model up a piece of like make something truly feel like it was captured in the 70s or in the 30s or whatever, that might be a useful application of uh, such a transform. But that's another thing that we tend to get upside down and confused about. It's like, no, no, you want it to feel that way. Like, I want my movie to feel like The French Connection or, uh, you know, like some uh, great 70s film. But that doesn't mean that I actually want to inhabit every single limitation and shortcoming that that film was plagued by, unless I'm trying to convince the audience that this is a lost shot from The French Connection. What's more likely is that I'm trying to steal what's best and what is signature and characteristic of The French Connection and translate it for a modern audience, for a modern display, and for a modern palette. Because if I don't do that, then I, I'm just quoting something and, and really not being much of an artist. So there's a bunch of considerations like that when it comes to a film negative. Like, all right, what are we going to do about the, the dynamic range problem? And it happens on uh, the top and on the bottom. At the bottom of, of a film negative, there's an entry point called the D-min. The, uh, the minimum amount of light that is needed to stimulate that negative to get a response. If you go below that light, that, that luminance level, you have a shelf. And spoiler alert, that shelf is above pure black. You can't give it one single nit above pure black is not enough to stimulate most film negative. Some uh, modern film negative maybe, but probably not. Um, so that's another thing you have to think about is do I want that kind of hard cut in the toe? Uh, and just to, to visually demonstrate that, that would be something like this. This is like what the D-min toe of a film negative looks like, roughly speaking. Kind of exaggerated a little bit further. You can see what I mean. So let's do something like this. Let me set a control point here. So you can see, see how my prints are getting, or my, my blacks are getting quote unquote printy. We call those printy because of the D-min of, of, of negative and print films. If you go below the D-min, you're not stimulating the negative with enough light for it to respond, for it to react. Because remember, it's an organic material. So that's another thing we have to evaluate. Like, all right, do I want that in there or not? So this is all a very long-winded way of saying that for me, personally, when I look at starting with like, okay, start with a one-to-one -one recreation of a film negative, but take away that reduction in dynamic range. I don't think I want that. Take away that, that curvature and, that's, and that uh, you know, like lifting of the toe. I may indeed want that, but I'd like to do that later. I'd like to have creative control over that later. I don't necessarily want to do it in two places. So do it at the negative and at the print stage. I want to do it in one. Um, take away uh, any, you know, like the other piece that we uh, didn't even really touch on is like, what's the effective gamut of a film negative? Like how many colors can it see and where are the edges of that? Maybe it's like, well, if I can capture more color and have that color available to me when I'm grading, wouldn't I want that? Especially if I'm going to be feeding into a look downstream anyway that's going to shape it into what I creatively want. So for me, thinking about the film negative, that's another piece. Where I'm like, all right, let's take that away. So I'm like, okay, so what's left? <laughs> Other than something simple like a matrix, which I could probably just incorporate as part of my creative look stack. So this to me kind of goes back to Jim's question. Everybody has their own way of thinking about this. And I really do understand and appreciate the idea of wanting to modularly and uh, tightly implement a recreation of film uh, in terms of like, here's my neg module and here's my halation and here's my grain and here's my print. If that floats your boat and you really like the results you get, like who am I to tell you that's wrong? For me, by the time I subtract the things I don't want from the neg, all that's left is stuff that I don't see any reason not to do as part of my creative transform on the print side. Whether or not I want to call that a print film emulation or not, I just don't see a benefit to doing a such a transform at the head of my node stack. And maybe this is all a very long-winded way of saying something even simpler, which is that I don't see the benefit of imposing technical constraints on my image at the head of the node graph 
nor do I really see the benefit of imposing a creative look at the head of my node graph. I'd rather that happen at the tail, and I'd rather it happen once, not twice. So very long answer, um, but that's those are kind of some of the principles and ideas there that all start from like, you know, th there it is possible to take the data from a film negative and say, well, what's the D min? What are the D log E curves, the response curves for the cyan, magenta, and yellow channels? You could pretty tightly model out if I neutralize the light that came from my Alexa and I move it into some common color space, what would the response to that light have been if I had shown it to a film negative? We can pretty well model that out in a one-to-one -one way. Then the much more difficult question uh, arises of like, well, what aspects of that model do we want? Uh, do we want all of them or some of them? And then how do we implement that? What else? Okay. Um, let's see. Rafa is here asking, could you talk about film texture emulation when filming with digital cameras? Yes. Yeah, definitely. So this is something that um, I've been doing a lot of research and exploration in, um, and I will, uh, there's a, a, a good link that uh, I'll share with you guys after our session today uh, on this subject. But I personally think that like the ideal place to start with texture is actually before you even get into grain to think about like what is the overall sharpness or softness or to, to use a fancy term that I've I think you've talked about once or twice here in uh, grade school the modulation transfer function literally how sharp or soft is my image at the bottom middle and top of it um, so that's kind of in a more objective sense, if we're talking about wanting to model the texture of a film system, what we really would want to start by modeling is the sharpness or softness of that entire system's rendering from end to end and get a good reproduction there. And then from there, you know, you could use uh, grain or, um, you know, like other additional textural elements, or you could use halation, which is sort of part of those spatial uh, or MTF considerations just done on a per channel basis because all all halation is is the MTF of a uh, particular layer of the film. Although I say that, I guess there there is there is the interaction of the, of the uh, it's halation is defined by the 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 bouncing of light off of the backing and back for a second time onto uh, one or more layers of the film. Um, so th this may be slightly more complex. But those are all like useful things. I would say like, let me kind of give it a, a bit of a, um, a practical creative bearing here. I've shown you guys my halation stack before, but let's like, let's go back to this tasty film print thing that I've been looking at. And let's just do a quick halation and um, uh, grain thing. So let's like look at, at uh, Alexis or uh, Isabella's rather highlights up here. I've got that kind of highlight bloomy thing happening here and I can decompose this and show you that all I'm doing is linearizing the image and then uh, applying a, a blurred version, just adding it on top of the image, which is roughly what you would get in a uh, the, the model of an actual um, negative. And then uh, upstream we could do, um, you know, any other, any, any number of grain, uh, solutions that we might like. I don't think I have this grain card pulled in, so it's not very happy with me. Let me find some grain, hang tight. Let's get some grain up in here. Okay, so we'll add this as a mat. And now I'm gonna select that grain card as my mat. And now I've got some grain going on here. And as you can see, if I decompose this node, what I do have in right now a pretty like broad way is I just have some softening going on, which I'm doing, I'm just doing a straight up like blur on it here. That's perhaps, or not perhaps, definitely not embodying all of the intricacies of the MTF curve of the film system that I might theoretically be kind of trying to model. But again, my, my whole thing when I'm grading here is I wanna get the essence. 
And this to me feels like the essence. This feels like the character. This feels like the thumbprint. I love the idea of getting a forensic model, but I'll put it to you maybe in another way. The distance between this and the tightest, most forensic model you could possibly devise for a film system, including halation grain and negative and film print colorimetry, I don't know how great that distance is. If it's if, if I'm less than 80% of the way to that ideal with what I have right here, I would be pretty surprised. I think I'm pretty much there. So it kind of becomes a question of like, you know, time in versus benefit out. I think I'm, I'm kind of there to my eye as an artist. And again, that should be what we are anchoring everything around when we're grading today. Like, I don't want this generation, like the, the you know, the, the generation of artists that I'm a part of and certainly those that are going to follow me and then follow them. It would really bum me out for our high water mark to be like, boy, we nailed the film emulation. We got like down to like the forensic details. We really got it right. That would be kind of a bummer, wouldn't it? We want to push further. We want to push past that. And that has to start with being willing to have a certain amount of, to exert some autonomy and say, well, this is deriving inspiration from that thing, but I'm using my eye to evaluate whether or not I have successfully uh, navigated myself to a good visual result or not. And in the same way, like I've kind of got both of these stacks that I just pulled in here calibrated to very roughly, not in like a, a super tight sense, but let me just uh, flip these back off into their kind of compounded states and turn this grain back on. I've got these kind of roughly calibrated to do what, what I feel like I see when I'm looking at a piece of printed film of well shot, well exposed, well developed printed film. I've kind of got these calibrated to the amount of halation and grain that I see in those. And usually the first thing that I do when I drop these in, I almost never use them at full strength. I'm gonna drop it to like 35% grain and maybe like 50% halation, just a kiss, just a little bit of it so that I can get the flavor in there without necessarily noticing it or being like married to what the film system would have done. I don't care what the film system would have done except to the extent that I, I like it, if that makes sense. Like I wanna steal the good and leave the rest behind because I'm not, my job is not to be a creative stenographer and uh, sort of like take the pieces from the and, and model the film system out one to one because that's what I'm supposed to do and it's against the rules to do anything else. I just want to steal what's good and leave the rest. That's that that's the the essence of creativity in my opinion. Um, so that's kind of how I would think about the the textural pieces there. And you could play with like where are you getting your grain cards from? In what space are you applying them? What's the scale of that grain? What's the, mush, the motion of that grain? How are you compositing it in? Those are all variables that uh, we can talk more about in future grade schools. We've talked about in the past. And there's more than one good answer there. And it really just comes down to like, how are you get like, how are you achieving best results? And if you don't, if you're not yet satisfied by the results, why not use uh, you know the actual model of the way it would have happened in a film system as your guide to get to a better result? But it's it's there as a it's there to help you not to uh, punish you type of thing. Like if the way that it works in a film system and modeling that out gets you uh, to a good spot, great. If that's not the way that it works in a film system, but modeling it out gets you modeling it that way gets you to a good spot, also great. Okay. Um, from, from Brennan, uh, he asks, if we can't build a good PFE ourselves, what are some tools outside Resolve we can use to do so or learn how to do so? Uh, in the meantime, should we rely on LUTs or software like the Answer or Color Lab, et cetera? Very good question. Yeah, so I, I would, I'll, I'll put it to you guys this way, and this actually gives me the opportunity to talk about something I'm really excited about. Uh, I've I've mentioned to you guys before. There's a bunch of new stuff uh, coming uh, out of uh, uh, out of my my world uh, starting in the new year. I've got an ebook coming out. I've got uh, a, a really good set of uh, creative transforms LUTs that uh, you guys are going to love. Um, but one of the things that I'm going to be actually releasing for free is a set of really high quality, really trustworthy print film emulation LUTs that work in scene space. So you're really going to like them. And if we look at like back to our original challenge of like, how do I get this when I am working like this? I'm going to show you one potential answer to that. Whoops, that will be this. So 
here's the reference and here's my scene print film emulation it's not identical but the character is very much there so that's something else you guys can look forward to that i'm i, I it'll be out in the next two weeks that you will have access to these use mine i'm giving them away for free you should use them because they're going to be better than a LUT that's going to be married to a display space. And they're also going to be better than um, the, 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 there is no LUT that's going to be better than these in terms of how trustworthy it is with what it, what it does with middle exposure and making sure that things aren't clipping or clamping and all that good jazz. So uh, I would say use mine. Um, there are other products out there that are good. Like I think Filmbox seems good. I like uh, the, uh, I, the, from the, limited uh, time that I've spent with it. I really like uh, Look Designer as well, um, but I would uh, pitch my pieces just because they're free and they're going to look awesome. So uh, look out for those. But that's what I would encourage. I definitely would, if you're really serious about wanting to recreate uh, film prints or you want to like do your own creative look in a really robust way, um, I would encourage you to sign up for the Show Let Design course that I'm doing with Color Training in the new year. I think that'll be in March. And above and beyond that, if you really want to dive into the deep end, uh, there's uh, the recordings of my creative color science class that I did uh, earlier this year with TAC Resolve Training. And there's going to be more some training, more training coming out on that front for more advanced uh, color science that's going to allow you to navigate the world that we put a toe into today uh, there on the Fusion page. What else? We got time for one or two more. Okay, let's see. Um, Heinz is curious if you soften the image before adding film grain, won't that affect mid-tone contrast? Won't that affect mid-tone contrast? Mm, I think that's a entirely perceptual question. Like that will affect mid-tone contrast, but then by that measure, softening the image before doing anything is going to, you know, like like softening the image is going to soften detail, adding contrast is going to add sharpness back in. So I, I think the only thing to do there is that's one of those instances where you do just need to evaluate your visual results and say, yes, I like that or no, when I softened by this amount and then subsequently added grain, it doesn't feel right anymore. It feels too uh, soft or thin in the midtones or whatever the concern is there. I think that's that that there there's no uh, objectively correct answer to that. There's just what works for your creative agenda. What um, else? We getting caught up? Yeah, let's. Uh, I guess maybe two quick ones. Um, one, how does uh, how do curve hue adjustments work differently than film print emulation? I think this was in response to your. Um, statement that, uh, or claim that people will try to get film print emulations just using primaries and such. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, cool. So I'm going to, I'm going to show you how this is going to look a little crazy, but here's the, the, the main thing that we need to understand when we are talking about, you know, I, I think another, I'm going to rephrase the question slightly in a way that I hope is fair. Um, if we are talking about why is it, why could we not get a good film emulation using, for example, some custom curves and then some hue verses or sat verses or some combination of all these curves? Why would that not be sufficient? Because it seems that we have the ability to control all the things that we see being altered in a film print. I'm going to answer that visually. Now stick with me. If you look at, if I go to a hue versus hue curve, you can read this curve, right? If you know where red is, where magenta, where blue, where green, all that stuff is, and I do this, even if I don't show you the image, you can read this curve, right? You can say, oh, there's a band of hues between here and there that are being selected and rotated counterclockwise, right? We can read all that without even looking at the image, right? So check this out. I've got this, this tool flipped on that I uh, developed for getting some better LUT analysis. And what I want to look at is the hue versus hue of this same 23, this is a 2393 uh, LUT, but same family. 
And what I want to do is look at the hue versus hue-ness of this LUT. It's like, okay, well, first things first, that's an interestingly complex and not at all what I would expect shape, right? But it gets worse. Because remember, what, what can we say? What's the one thing that we have in common about any of these curves? How many axes do these curves have? How many dimensions do these curve, ha curves have? Two. That's all we have. That's not the way things work. Remember when we were looking at that cube? Those behaviors don't scale up and down in three dimensions. Those behaviors change. So if I'm on my hue versus hue and I think, okay, great. So if I can just draw a hue versus hue curve that matches all of this, that might take me a while. But if what you're telling me is after I do this, I will have precisely recreated the hue remappings of this particular LUT, I feel like I could take an hour and probably get pretty close to that, right? Here's where things get hairy. Watch when I evaluate the hue versus hue manipulations of this same scene look that we were looking at up and down the tone scale. Right now we're at 50%. They change. They change all up and down the tone scale. They're not the same. So there is no one hue versus hue curve that we can draw here. And similarly, no one hue versus loom curve that we could draw here that is going to embody the complexity of the behavior of this film print because it changes, it's operating in three dimensions. And the reason why we're not operating in three dimensions with these tools is because operating in three dimensions is tough and it's confusing. It's much easier to operate in two than in three, but there's not sufficient complexity there to actually model out all of the behaviors that we can see happening in here. And these aren't little changes, are they? Look at the change in the character of this curve as I move up and down, in this case, my different points of saturation where my hue, where the luminance of different hues are being affected. At the, what I'm saying here is like, well, at what saturation of a particular hue are you interested in seeing how the luminance is being affected? At a high saturation of this hue, it's being affected in this way. At a low saturation of this hue, it's being affected in that way. So there's all of this nonlinearity and three dimensionality that we kind of have to take into account if we're wa wanting to model out the film system. And if not, we at least need to be operating in curves and thinking in three dimensions. It is not enough to be thinking in two dimensions because that's not how our, that's not the domain of our image. The domain of our image is three dimensions. Um, so I, I, and I want to be clear here, trying your best to recreate a film print using custom curves and the hue versus sat and hue versus hue that's a very worthy exercise and in fact i would encourage you to do it um, my point is that ultimately if we're wanting to generate a really robust and know that we have generated a really robust model we got to step out of the color page a little bit simply because the color page isn't designed to do that it's not because we are ineffective and that we can't learn how to be better at this it's because we're you know like to use a funny analogy, you know, like, could I, it's July and it's hot as hell in the apartment and I don't want to get an air conditioner. Could I just open my freezer? Yeah. Yeah. That's going to cool the house down. That it's going to be colder, especially close to the freezer than uh, when the freezer was closed. Is that a great idea? Is that the same thing as having an air conditioner? No, it's not. Um, but in this case, uh, there's no downside to trying out your freezer as an air conditioner and seeing how far you can get. And if you get there and you're like, man, this looks awesome, Colin's crazy. I think I, all I need is right here inside of Resolve. Then I'd love to hear about that from you guys. Uh, but that's been uh, my definitive experience over many years of doing this. If you really wanna build a robust thing and know you've built a robust thing properly that's gonna stand up on not just one or 10, but 100 or 1,000 shots, you gotta be evaluating things uh, with more context and you need to be manipulating them in three full dimensions. Um, cool guys. Great session. Uh, really glad as always to talk color grading with you guys and to talk about, uh, film print emulation. And I really hope that, uh, all of the stuff I've thrown at you that might be a little overwhelming, you don't find it discouraging. You find it inspiring. Like I I've been falling into the deep end of these, uh, questions for many, many years now. And if you just let yourself be overwhelmed and let the, you know, like all of the, 
uh, you know, like potential avenues of exploration and all of the information, just let it drown you. Don't try to swim in it. Just let it drown you and enjoy it. Then you're going to have a lot of fun. If you try to fight it and uh, you, you uh, feel frustrated until the moment you can finally understand everything, that just means you're going to feel frustrated forever because no one understands uh, everything about this stuff. You could literally spend the rest of your life studying it. So enjoy the ride. Enjoy being overwhelmed by it. And I hope I've piqued your curiosity and at least left you with a couple of ideas for stuff you can do for building a humble little look inside of Resolve and also uh, ideas for, um, you know, like where you might want to push your creative practice and your toolkit as an artist beyond uh, simply grading in uh, the color page inside of Resolve and uh, also get you excited about some stuff that's coming out. These uh, I'm really excited to share these uh, film print scene referred uh, looks with you guys. Got the ebook coming out. Uh, a bunch of other really fun stuff that we're going to be announcing soon in 2022. So uh, looking forward to sharing all that with you guys. And I'm looking forward to another holiday edition of Grade School next week on New Year's Eve. Because if we can do it on Christmas Eve, why the hell can't we do it on New Year's Eve? We'll have another fun session like this. Uh, and any of us who can make it and break away from family and festivities, uh, it'll be well worth our time. So in the meanwhile, I hope you guys have a uh, great Christmas Eve and a great Christmas holiday. And I'm looking forward to seeing all of you guys next week. Have a good one.